good day to you or it's a privilege to meet you once again. In our previous session, we started looking at practical questions at the core biology. And the selected questions we are going to have all been uploaded onto the WhatsApp page. If you still haven't downloaded the PDF, please go to the WhatsApp page and do so. Now in the questions, I've answered some of them. There are some too that have not been answered. So the ones that have not been answered are the ones that we are going through in class. In our previous session, we looked at question five, question nine, and then question 12. We're going to continue today by looking at question 20, question 21, question 22, and if possible, if there's time, we'll look at question 24. 24. So without much ado, we're going to start from question 20. Question 20. It says that in an illustration of an experimental setup to show that carbon dioxide is necessary for photosynthesis. It says study the figure carefully and answer the questions that follow. So we have the question, the figure given. And based on the figure, you are supposed to answer the following questions. Question A, I says, name the parts labeled I, 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 and IV. And then the A, I, I says, name or state one function of the part labeled IV. Part labeled IV. So question 20. AI says you should name the part labeled I up to IV. So you have I, 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 and then IV. So the part labeled I is the cock. But specifically, if you look at the cork here, there's a slight difference from the ones that we've come across under preparation of gases. So this one referred to as a split cork. Split cork. The split cork. And then the II is the conical flask. Conical flask. Conical flask. The I I I is the flower pot, or oh, you say the verse. So flower pot. And then the I V is the repulsant. Okay, so that is for AI. We've labeled the various part from I to IV. The I says we should state one function of the part labeled IV. So the function of the IV, that's the retort stand. So the retort stand there is to hold the conical flux firmly in position. So it helps. It helps to hold, or it simply put, it holds the conical flux firmly in position. Okay, so that is for E, I, I. Now the B, question B. Question B says that what is the role of sodium hydroxide in the experiment? In the experiment. When we're looking at question 12, which also was a setup to show that carbon dioxide is necessary for 
photosynthesis. We came across sodium hydroxide. I told you that weed is a base. It can be calcium hydroxide or it can be sodium hydroxide. The essence of sodium hydroxide in a setup to test for carbon dioxide is for the sodium hydroxide to absorb, to absorb the carbon dioxide that is present in the air. So the function of the sodium hydroxide in this experiment is to absorb the carbon dioxide that is present in the air in the conical flask. So that's the function of the sodium hydroxide. So the sodium hydroxide helps to absorb the carbon dioxide gas which is present in the air in the conical flask containing leaf A. So it is a conical flask containing leaf A. That is the the, the part that is labeled I, I that's the conical flask which contains leaf A. It is in that conical flask that you have the sodium hydroxide. So the sodium hydroxide will absorb the carbon dioxide gas that is present in the air in that conical flask. Okay, so that is for B. Question B. Then uh, the C, I, it says which of the labeled leaves serves as the control which of the labeled leaves serves as the control and the, the ci I say explain your answer so we have two leaves there leaf a and then leaf b leaf a and leaf b uh, so which of the leaves is serving as a control it is the leaf b that is serving as a control why is it serving as a control? Because the leaf B has been provided with all the factors and conditions necessary for photosynthesis. So the leaf in B has access to water. It has access to carbon dioxide. It has also access to sunlight. For leaf A, it has access to sunlight Obviously, it can also get access to water. But what is actually lacking there is the carbon dioxide. Because in the conical flask, the air that is available, the sodium hydroxide is absorbing the carbon dioxide. So it means that leaf A is deprived of carbon dioxide. So because of the absence of carbon dioxide, which is actually a raw material for photosynthesis, leaf A will not undergo photosynthesis. It is leaf B which undergoes photosynthesis because it has been provided with all the factors and conditions necessary for photosynthesis. So for CI, leaf B serves as the control. So leaf B serves as the control. And then I says you should give it a reason. So the reason, as I said, is that the D has been provided with all the factors and conditions necessary for photosynthesis.
factors and conditions. Necessary for photosynthesis. Okay, so of the two leaves, leaf B serves as a control. And why is it serving as a control? Because it has been provided with all the factors and conditions necessary for photosynthesis. So that is for C. That is for C. We're going to look at D. Question D. This is what observations could be made when the leaves A and B are tested for starch. So when I was explaining C, I told you that the, the leaf A, because of the sodium hydroxide in the conical flask, the leaf A is deprived of carbon dioxide, which is actually a, a raw material necessary for photosynthesis. But the leaf B has all the factors and conditions. So it is the leaf B that, would, uh, that will undergo photosynthesis. And then leaf A, there will be absence of photosynthesis. So it means that for leaf A, because it does not undergo photosynthesis, when tests for presence of starch, uh, the observation will be negative. That is, no blue black color will be formed. Uh, but if for leaf B, because photosynthesis has occurred, when tests for the presence of starch, there will be a positive result. So what observations could be made when leaves A and B are tested for starch? For A, the leaf will turn blue-black. And then for B, it will not turn blue-black. So leaf, leaf A. It will turn blue black and then leave B it will not turn blue black. Okay, so that is observation. Why, anyway, so why is leaf A turning blue black? Because as I said, photosynthesis has occurred in A. So, starch has been formed. So when it tests for presence of starch, the observation is that you have a blue-black PPT formed. So that is why leaf A will turn blue black. But leaf B has not undergo photosynthesis. It means that no starch has been formed. So if it tests for presence of starch, you will not see the blue-black PPT formed. Okay. Uh, then the E. The question E says, outline the procedure to be followed in setting up this experiment. I told you that when it comes to experiments involving photosynthesis, one of the first thing you are supposed to do is to make sure that the leaves of the plant you are using has been distached. Distached. How do you distach a leaf? You have to make sure that the plant is kept in a dark room for about two to three days so that all the starch that were originally formed, all those starch will be converted to glucose and to be utilized by the plant in the process of respiration. So that is how you distach the leaves of the plant, by keeping it in a dark room for about two to three days before you start the, the experiment. That's the first thing to do. So to outline the processes, the first thing you do is to keep the potted plant in a dark room for three days in order to distach the leaves of the plant. So the first step. The potted plant is kept in a 
a dark room. For about three days. To this touch the leaves of the plants so that's the first step so we keep the, pl uh, the potted plant in a dark room for about three days and in order to detach the leaves of the plant And then from the diagram that is given, uh, you see this setup is slightly different from uh, the setup in question uh, question nine. So in this, you see that one of the leaf has been enclosed in a conical flask, and in that conical flask there is sodium hydroxide. The leaf containing or the conical flask with the sodium hydroxide, the leaf in that one has been labeled as A. And after that, there is a cork inserted, and you also have the conical flask what, clamped. And then also we have a second leaf labeled as B, which is inside another conical flask containing water. That conical flask is also corked, and then it is also a clamped. And then the whole setup is exposed to sunlight. And then you have the two leaves plugged and then tested for a starch. So that is the entire process. So for leaf A, so. Enclose one of the leaves. Labeled as A. Labeled as leaf A. In a conic. In a conical flask, containing containing sodium hydroxide. Insert a split cock and carefully clamp. conical flask and family and family clamp the conical flask in position. Then the next one to you enclose another leaf. Another leaf labeled as the B. 
in a different conical flask. A different conical flask containing water. And then point five, just like leaf A, you insert a split cork. Family family clump the conical flask. In position. And then six expose. Let's set up to sunlight. For about six hours. And the last thing is you plug leaf A and B and test for starch using ID solution. So plug leaves A and B and test for starch using iodine solution. So these are the steps that are involved in the procedure illustrated in the setup. Illustrated in the setup. Okay, the last question here is precautions. Precautions. The precautions. It says a state one precaution to be taken to ensure the success of this experiment. Uh, the first precaution here has to do with the step one. For this experiment, as I said, you, you must ensure that the, the leaves of the plant is detached. And how do you do that? By ensuring that you keep the leaf, uh, the, the, the potted plant in a room for about two to three days. So that is a precaution. So the leaves of the potted plant must be Stashed by keeping the plant in a dark room. For about three days. Now, what other precaution is here? Is there? The other precaution is that you have to make sure that the experiment is airtight. That is, the conical flask must be airtight. And how do you ensure that it is airtight? By 
properly uh, inserting the conical flux head by properly inserting the split cork and then also appear uh, and also applying Vaseline at the neck of the conical flask to make it airtight. Okay. So properly. Setting the split cock and applying Vaseline on the neck. Tight. Okay, so, so you apply Vaseline on the neck of the conical flask and you also properly f insert the split cork to make it airtight so that you don't see any air from outside entering into the conical flask. Entering into the conical flask. So these are some precautions. You can also add this that the conical flask must be properly clamped must be properly clamped to hold it firmly in position so that is the third precaution you can also choose to add the the conical flux must be properly clamped to hold it firmly in position to hold it firmly in position so you are supposed to give one of written to the third one because of space i'm not adding down but you can also add that so the third one is that the conical flux both conical flux must be properly clamped in order to hold them firmly in position in order to hold them firmly in position so those are the uh, three precautions you can write from this experiment from this experiment so that brings us to the end of question 20. Question 20. We're going to quickly look at question 21. So our next set of questions is on question 21, question 21. Now the question says figure two is an illustration of plant organs used in vegetative propagation. Vegetative propagation. Vegetative propagation is also the same as asexual reproduction in, asexual reproduction in plants. It's a, we are looking at, so this question is on asexual reproduction or vegetative propagation under plants, under plants. You see, study carefully the figure and answer the questions that follow. 
and answer the questions that follow. So you have the diagram given. There are two set of diagrams. The diagram labeled A and the diagram labeled B. And you are asked to, the A says, identify the organs A and B. A and B. So if you look at organ A, it appears as ginger. And B appears as onion. So you are looking at vegetative propagation. So if ginger, if A appears as ginger, what, in what way is ginger propagated? So ginger is propagated through the use of rhizome. So A is a rhizome. And then B, which looks like as an onion, onion is propagated through the use of bulb. So the B is bulb. So organ A is a rhizome, and organ B is a bulb. So that is for question A. So organ A is a rhizome. And then organ B is bulb. Please, the spellings are very important. Practical work, everything. Make sure you spell accurately. So take notes of the spellings. Now the B, question B. B I says name the part labeled I up to V I I V I I I and then I the question I says you should state one function of the part labeled I I V and then the V I I I so for the I we labeling the part from I and so for the I we are so we are going to la label from I to V I I so you have the I I I I I I I V V V I V I I and then a V I I I. So the part labeled I I is it's not just leaf. That's the foliage leaf. The the fresh leaves that are developing. So the foliage leaf. Foliage leaf. Then we have the eye, eye as the scaly leaves or scaly leaves. Then your the eye, eye, eye is the stem. This stem is not. It's actually reduced, very small. And then your IV is adventitious root adventitious root and then we have the the V the V is also a scale leaf The VI is a bud. Bud. It's between, okay, so you can say auxiliary bud. The VI is also adventitious root. And then the last one, the V I I, that's a step. Okay. All right. So these are the labeled parts from I to V I I I. Now the B I says you should give the functions of. You have I I B I. You are given the functions of the parts labeled I. The I is the foliage leaf. 
So what is the function of the foliage leaf? So that is where photosynthesis occurs. So for photosynthesis or for preparing of food substances. So, so simply for so for preparation of food. through the process of photosynthesis. So you should know that it is a leaf that is the organ for photosynthesis. We are also supposed to give the function of the part labeled IV. The part labeled IV. It's that's adventitious root, so that's for absorption of water and dissolved nutrients from the soil. So, for absorption of water and dissolved. Nutrients from the soil, and then you also supposed to give the function of VIII. The VIII is the stem. The VIII is the stem. So that is for storage of prepared food, or you can also say for absorption of, or for the transfer of water and nutrients from the roots to the leaf. So that's the function of the stem. So it, it transports absorbed water and nutrients from the roots to the leaves, and also it serves as a storage organ. So for storage, Prepared food substance. Storage of prepared food. So that is one function. The other function is, as I said, for uh, transport of water and dissolved nutrients from the roots to uh, the leaves. Okay, so I'm saying, um, for transport. Water and nutrients from the roots to the leaves. Okay, so these are the functions of the part labeled I for preparation of food through pro uh, the process of photosynthesis. IV, the IV is the root adventitious root for absorption of water and dissolved nutrients from the soil. And then the VI, which is the stem, is for storage of prepared food. That is the food that is prepared for, by the leaves. It is the stem that stores it and also it helps in transport of the water and nutrient that is absorbed by the root it transports it to to the leaves question c it says give two observable similarities and two observable differences between organs a and or and b so the first thing is we're looking at observations that are similar in both a and b and then we look at differences, observations that differ in terms of A and B. So for question C, similarities between 
Oh, guns. E and B. So what feature, what do you see in organ A at the same time in organ B? If you look at some of the label part, you can see that the label part appear for both organ A and organ B. So you can see that both have adventitious roots. So both have adventitious roots. And then secondly, both have scale leaves. Scale leaves. Also have bats. So both have bats. We can also talk of both having notes. Both having notes. Both. Have notes. Okay, so these are some similarities between organs A and B. You are supposed to give two. I'll give you four. And then you're also supposed to give differences between organs A and B. So differences. Differences between organs A and B. So this way, put this in a tabular form. You have organ A. of organ B. Now, what, what is the first difference you see here? You see that if you're looking at the appearance of A, the A is elongated. It's long, elongated. But the B is, is round in shape. So that is one difference. So A is elongated in shape and the B is round in shape. So it is elongated in shape. And this one is round in shape. It is round in shape. So that is one difference. Now if you look at the spacing between the nodes, between the nodes we have the spacing for A is, is narrow, is, is short. So if you see two nodes, between two nodes, the space between them is what we call the internode. Internode. So if you compare the internode, the internode in A is, is shorter or narrow. But the internode between, uh, the internode in the B, that one is wider, longer. So shorter internode longer internode or you can see the spacing 
between the internodes is narrow, and yeah, the spacing between the internode uh, between the nodes is is wider, wider. Okay. So to so spacing. between the nodes is narrow and yeah spacing spacing between the nodes Then you can also add this. If you look at the stem, the stem, the stem in in the B, as I said, is so small, it's reduced. But the main main part of the organ B consists of the stem. Consists of the stem. So here the stem is reduced, but here the stem is large. Or elongated. So, it's there. It's large. Or you can say elongated. Yeah, the stem is reduced. stem is reduced. And so that is the third thing. So this has a large or elongated stem and the, the stem is reduced. So these are the differences between organs A and then B. So that's for question C. Now question D it says that least two observable features of organ A, which make it suitable for vegetative propagation. So, what features does organ A has that makes it for it to be uh, vegetatively propagated, or for it to be propagated through asexual means? Through asexual means. So, one, so one, presence of, presence of bad, and presence of notes. So these are some uh, features that make organ A to be suitable for vegetative propagation, for vegetative propagation. And then the last question here, that's E. It says that state three reasons why organ A is regarded as a shoot. Why is organ A regarded as a shoot? So if you take uh, a plant, a plant has two systems. So you have the root system, and then you have the shoot system. So your roots actually consist of the parts below the soil level. And when I talk of the shoot, usually the part above the stem, 
far above the stem. So all, 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 all parts that attach to the stem form parts of the shoot. So the leaves, the branches, the fruits, the flowers, the buds, they all form part of the shoot system. So for, from the label part of organ A, the, the features that make it as a shoot are one. These two are still there. So presence of, of bat, presence of notes, and then you also have presence of leaves. All those are part of the shoot system of a plant of a plant. So this ends question twenty one. This ends question twenty one. So our next question is question 22. Question 22. Question 22 says, the diagram below is an illustration of an organ found in a flowering plant. You see, study the diagram carefully and answer the questions that follow. Okay, so we have the diagram indicated, and then he's supposed to answer the questions. The first question says, A, identify the organ illustrated. So you all know that that organ is the leaf. So leaf of a plant. So question A is leaf. Leaf. To be specific, this leaf of this leaf of a die cut plant. So leaf of a die cut plant. Die cotyledonous plant. So, uh, the leaf of a dicotyledonous plant. You, you all know that we, also, we have monocot, monocotyledonous plant. An example of monocotyledonous plant is maize, maize plant. So, if you see the leaf of a maize plant, it's different from what is drawn here. So, if you, instead of just saying leaf of a plant, you can be specific and say leaf of a, a dicotyledonous plant. Okay. I'm sure that if you just write leaf, the organs, if you take a plant, the organs are the leaf, the roots, and then the stem. So if you just write leaf, I'm sure that you also be considered. Then the D part, you are supposed to, you are supposed to name the parts labeled I, to V, I, I, I. So we have I, 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 V, 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 I, V, I, 
I I and the last one B I I I. For the I part is that's the leaf apex, or you can say the leaf tip. So you have the leaf apex. I can simply put leaf tip. And then the I I is the leaf margin. Leaf. Margin. Leaf margin. And then your I, I, I is what we call the lamina. Lamina. Or you can also label as leaf bleed. So you have the lamina. The lamina. And then you have the IV. The meat rib. You have the meat rib. Midrib. Attached to the midrib, we have the veins. And then the veins branches to smaller ones called veinlets. So the part labeled V is what is attached to the midrib. So that is the vein. Vein. And then the vein branches to smaller ones, which we call vein like veinlet. So if you look at VI, it is also a branch coming from the V. So that is a veinlet. That is a subdivision of the vein, a smaller form of the vein. And then your V, I, I, is the leaf stalk, leaf stalk or we call the pitot, the pitot. So it's the same as the leaf stalk. And then your V, your V I I I, that is the bud. Is between the azo, the stem and the leaf. If you have, if this a stem, and then you have the leaf stalk. This is the leaf stalk. The space between, or the angle between this, the leaf. So this is the leaf stalk. This is the stem. This space is what we call the azo. So if you have a bud growing there, that's what we call it, the axillary bud. That's what we call it, the axillary bud. So the space between the leaf stalk and the stem is what we call the axil. So if you have a bud growing there, the bud, it is from the bud that you have the flowers. All that. So if you see a bud developing there, then we call it the axillary bud. So that is axillary bud. Sometimes you also call it auxiliary, auxiliary bud, auxiliary bud. Just like in, your, in English, you have auxiliary verbs. We also call this auxiliary. Auxiliary bud. Okay, so if someone writes it as auxiliary bud or someone also writes auxiliary bud, it's the same thing. Okay, so those are the labeled parts of uh, the organ. The scene says, states two observable features of the organ, which adapt it for its functions. So this is the adaptation of the leaf for its function. Adaptation of the leaf for its function. You should know that 
one function of the leaf is to is to help in preparation of food that is in the process of photosynthesis. The leaf also serves as organ where transpiration occurs, where excess water is lost from the plant. So adaptation of the leaf for transpiration as well as for photosynthesis. That's what the question is asking about. So two observable features of the organ which adapt it for eight functions. For eight functions. So for C. One. So the leaf so is brought. So you can see that the leaf appears broad. It is broad and obviously it is also thin. And this allows it for absorption or maximum absorption of sunlight. So the leaf is broad. So for maximum absorption. Of sunlight for photosynthesis. So it is brought for maximum absorption of sunlight for photosynthesis. The leaf also appear thin, so it is also thin. And that helps in easy absorption of gases. So absorption of carbon dioxide, which is a raw material for, for photosynthesis. So it is thin for easy absorption or exchange of gases. Okay. And also there is presence of veins and veinlets for transport of absorbed water and then nutrients. So it is thin. It is thin. And this helps in easy exchange of gases. And there are also there's presence of vent. And then let for transport of absorbed water and nutrients.
So the presence of veins and veinlets for transport of absorbed water and nutrients. So those are some observable features. And then the last question here is question D. Question D says you state a function of the part labeled G I I and then the part labeled I X. Okay, so function, you're supposed to give the function of the part labeled V I I, which is the leaf stalk. So what's the function of the leaf stalk? It's to hold the leaf family in position. So the leaf stalk, that is the V I. It holds the leaf firmly in position. And then the IX, the IX, it serves as a, the point of attachment. So that is why the petiole or the leaf stalk is attached to the, the stem or the branch. So it serves as a point of attachment of the leaf stalk to the stem or branch. So it serves as the point of attachment of the leaf stalk to the stem or branch. Okay, so that is for the part labeled IX. So that is where the leaf stalk is attached to the stem or to the branch. The branch. So that ends question 22. Question we're looking at today is question 23. Question 23. So that's the last question we're going to look at today. Uh, this question falls under control and coordination. Control and coordination. And specifically, this under the reflex arc. Reflex arc. So then when you're looking at the nervous system, we have the reflex arc. What is responsible for reflex action? So the path that uh, the nerve impulse travels across during uh, a reflex action. A reflex action. So, for instance, during the blinking of an eye, that is a, a, a reflex action. Reflex action. Uh, if, for instance, you step uh, your foot on a sharp object like nail or a hot object, and then you quickly withdraw your leg, that is also a reflex action. A reflex action. Okay, so the path along which the impulse travels is what we call the reflex act. So the diagram you are seeing there is for reflex action, which we call the reflex act. So the, the diagram there is what we call the reflex act. Reflex act. Okay. So you are not asked to label the, the diagram. I'm not of what the diagram represents. If you are asked to state what the diagram represents in the body, then it represents the reflex arc. 
fruitless ark. Now, so the question it says that. Oh, okay. There is an A part of the question. The A part of the question is is that you are supposed to construct a food chain using the organisms listed below. So we have hawk, we have grasshopper, we have frog, and then we have grass. So a food chain shows uh, the direction of energy from one organism to the other. So it shows the feeding relationship between two, three, or more organisms. So which organisms feed on one, which is also feeding on the other. So that's what we call the food chain. So here, a food chain always begins with a... with green plants, which in this case is the grass. So a food chain only begins with producers, and producers usually consist of green plants. That is organism that produce their own food. So grass here is a plant, so it produces its own food. So it starts the, the food chain. Then the next one is the primary consumer. What fits directly on the, on the green plant or the producer? So from the grasshopper, the frog, and the hawk. The grasshopper fits on the grass. So the next organism is the grasshopper. And they have the tertiary, oh no, the secondary. So this is the primary consumer. It is feeding on the producer. We have the secondary consumer. It feeds on the primary consumer. So if you take hawk and then the frog, the frog feeds on the grasshopper. So the frog becomes the secondary consumer. And then we have the tertiary consumer, which feeds on the secondary consumer, which in this case is the hawk. So the hawk fits on the frog. So the food chain begins with grass. The grasshopper fits on the grass. The frog fits on the grasshopper. And then the hawk feeding on the frog. So that is the food chain. Food chain. It is the bee that I was talking about initially as the reflex arc. It says that, okay, it was even stated there. It says, fake. For illustrate a reflex act in a human. You see, study the figure carefully and answer the questions that follow. The I says you should name the parts label from I up to V, I, I, I. So I. So the eye is a, the sensory receptor. Sensory receptor. What receives the stimulus? So for instance, if, if my hand touches a hot object, the skin or the palm of the hand is serving as a sensory receptor because that is where the feeling is. Okay, so the, the stimulus. So the sensory receptor, what receives the stimulus? And then the eye is a sensory nerve cell, or it's a neuron. The neuron is the same as nerve cell. So instead of saying sensory neuron, you can also say sensory nerve cell. So that is what transmits impulses. So when you touch a hot object, stimulus is generated. The stimulus is uh, transformed into an impulse. And then the sensory neuron will transmit that impulse into the, the spinal cord. So the reflex act usually involves the spinal cord. But some of the uh, 
impulses can also be sent to the brain. But in most cases of reflex act, it is a spinal cord. So that is the work of the sensory neuron. And then the the I I I we call it the synapse. I say synapse. So that is the I I I. The synapse. So the synapse serves as a bridge between two neurons, the sensory neuron, and then we also have another neur uh, neuron known as the motor neuron. Okay. Then we have uh, the IV is the intermediate, the inter intermediate. Neuron. The intermediate neuron, that's a neuron between the sensory neuron and what we call the motor neuron. So that's what connects the sensory neuron to the motor neuron. Then you have the V as the dorsal root. Dorsal root. And then the B I S the ventral root. The V I R is the motor neuron that I was talking about. So th this receives the stimulus and then it generates Impulses. The impulse is transported by the sensory neuron to the spinal cord, where a response is generated. This intermediate neuron transfers that response to the dosa, uh, to the motor neuron, and then the motor neuron will send it to the organ responsible for carrying out the response. Now the sensory neuron passes through the dorsal root, and then we have the motor neuron also passing through the ventral root. And the last portion is the effector organ. Uh, in this case, you can say muzzle. Effector organ or muzzle. So for instance, if it's your hand, that is touching the hot object. For you to lift it, the response has to be carried out by the, the muscles of the arm. For it to contract, in order for you to eject or remove what, your hands. So this one, the effector organ of the muscle helps in carrying out the response that was produced by the spinal cord or that was produced in the brain. And okay, so these are the parts of the uh, reflex arc, reflex arc. The I, I, I says you should give the function of the parts labeled I, alpha, I. Part of the, the function of the part labeled I. So the I, as I said, that's the sensory receptor. That is used for, so that one receives stimulus and also generates a sensory nerve impulse. So it receives Stimulus and generates a sensory nerve impulse. And the beta, we are supposed to give the function of the part labeled I, I, I. The I, I, I is a synapse. Okay. So the synapse accepts 
plus a gap or bridge between the sensory neuron So it serves as a, a gap or bridge between, as you can see, the sensory neuron and then the, the intermediate neuron. So it transmits the impulses between the sensory neuron and then the intermediate neuron. So. so it serves as a gap or bridge. bridge. Transmit and process to the intermediate neuron. And then the last one V I I I. The VI is the effector organ of the muscle. So that is what is responsible for carrying out the response to the uh, impulse generated. So it helps to carry out the response. response to the impulse generated. So that's the function of the muzzle or the effector. It helps to carry out the response to the impulse generated. And then the last question that is I, I, I. Alpha. It says you should explain what will happen when each of the following label part is damaged. When so alpha is V, when the part labeled V is damaged, and then beta is VI, when the part labeled VI is damaged. You say the part labeled V is the dorsal root, and then the part labeled VI is the ventral root. So the question is asking that if the dorsal root is damaged, what will happen? And similarly, if the ventral root is damaged, what will happen? And initially, I told you that the sensory neuron passes through the dorsal root, and then the motor neuron passes through the ventral root. The sensory neuron is what is responsible for transmitting sensory nerve impulses from the receptor to the spinal cord. So if the dorsal root is damaged. That means the sensory neuron will be damaged. And therefore, nerve impulses, sensory nerve impulses from the sensory receptor will not reach the spinal cord. Similarly, the motor neuron is what is responsible for transmitting motor nerve impulses from the spinal cord to the effector organ. So it means that if the ventral root is damaged, the motor neuron will also be damaged, and then motor nerve impulses from the spinal cord will not be able to reach the effector organ or the muscle. Okay. So when the V, that is the dorsal root, is damaged, sensory nerve. impulses sensory nerve impulses 
will will not be transmitted. Sensory Nero from the receptor to the spinal cord. So when the dosal root is done, the sensory nerve impulses will not be transmitted by the sensory neuron from the receptor to the spinal cord. And then beta for VI, as I said, if the ventral root is damaged, then motor nerve impulses spinal cord will not be transmitted by the motor neuron to the effector organ or muscle. Okay, so that is what happens. If the ventral root where the the sensory neuron is passing, if it is damaged, then the sensory neuron will not be able to play it through. Right. What is the rule of the sensory neuron? It's to transmit impulses from the receptor to the spinal cord. And similarly, if the ventral root is damaged, where the motor neuron passes, then the motor neuron will not be able to uh, perform its function. And the rule of the motor neuron is to transmit impulses from the spinal cord to the effector organ or to the muscle. So that brings, that ends question. 23. And as I said, question 23 is the last question we are looking at today. So it brings us to the end of today's session. In our next session, we're going to look at the remaining questions. That's question 24, question 25, question 26, and then question 27. Uh, so I, uh, it is my prayer that in our next session, we'll be able to exhaust the remaining questions under the core biology practical. Remember to always stay at home and be safe. If you have nothing to do in town, make sure you stay indoors. And always remember to spend quality time in studying. Don't come back with nothing in your head. Make sure you continue to participate in all the interactions on the various platforms. The WhatsApp platform the Google Classroom, as well as the online Edu TV. Make sure you, you prepare and learn hard so that when school resumes and then you start writing your examinations, you would have been fully prepared. Until we meet again, enjoy the, re the rest of the day. Bye.